Hello there, and welcome back to the Prolific Author Podcast. I have been a little bit quiet for the last few weeks, but that is because I have been having a really, really crazy month, which I'll tell you about in just a minute. But I hope everyone is doing really well with their writing this week. I have a really fun interview for you with, with Vince Warnock, who is kind of a master marketer and coach. So he has a lot of great insights that I'm really excited for you guys to hear and try to apply to yourselves and your fiction writing. Um, in terms of the personal update, so <laughs> I have joked many times, what is July 2021? I mean, it's just been kind of a black hole for me. I, um, as many of you who listen know, I put on my writing workshop, which went very, very well. I was very pleased with the results and with everyone who participated. So thank you so much if you did that. I opened the doors to my course for the beta launch, which also went very well. And I am now guiding my first students through the course and having a great time doing it. Right after that, I went on vacation for a week, which was something that was planned months ago um, that I knew was going to happen. I just went down to St. George, Utah, which is um, a little over an hour south of where I am, but it was super fun, great family vacation. I, I had a blast there, lots of um, fun times, but also relaxation. You kind of need that, you know, every so often to uh, get away from the day job and, and from the pressures of daily life. So I had a lot of fun there. But there was another wrench that was kind of thrown into the mix, and that was that we very suddenly decided to move. Now, I won't go into the, uh, the weeds of this too much, but just the way that the housing market is around where I live, we actually have a lot of people flocking to Utah right now. And so it's actually difficult to find a house just because there are so many people who need them. You know, the need is, is big and um, most houses are being rented sight unseen. So my family just wanted to expand a little bit. We have grown a bit in the last year and we just decided we wanted to get into a bigger place where we could spread out a little bit more, have a little more bathroom room, that sort of thing. So it wasn't anything urgent, but just something we had been looking for. But we looked for like eight months to find something that was, you know, in our price range, would meet our needs. And it's not that we didn't find any in those eight months. It was that there's so many people trying to get in, we just didn't get any of them. So we kept having to look and put in more applications. You, you get the idea. Well, it just so happened that in this month when I had all this other stuff going on, we finally got a place and we were very, very grateful for that. But um, again, because there is so many people trying to get into these homes, they usually want you to be in once they have approved your application within about three weeks. So we had to move in in the midst of all of this <laughs> of doing my course and and guiding my students, you know, through the opening weeks of the um, academy, and also doing the planned vacation. And then I came back and I had to move everything in a hurry over into the new place. And now we are getting unpacked. So, like I said, it has been a crazy July for me, and that's why I've been probably a little bit silent and um, a little bit not not as visible, just not as visible as usual. That's all. Um, but I'm happy to be back. We are not entirely moved in, but we're to a point now where we can just, you know, unpack four or five boxes a day until it gets done. You know, most of the furniture's in and where it needs to be, and we can kind of go back to work a little bit now. So I'm excited to get back to it. And here I am. And that was kind of a long personal update for me, but that's kind of, <laughs> that's what my last few weeks have been like. They have been crazy. And I'm going to be doing a lot of catch up work for probably the next two to three weeks. And then, then after that, I should be golden. So anyway, um, I don't have a whole lot of announcements other than that, other than the things are going really, really well. And I'm going to get back to doing lives in the Facebook group. So if you're not in there, make sure and join the Prolific Author Facebook group. And yeah, other than that, let's just jump right into this interview. I think you guys are going to find it really, really valuable. Vince is a great guy and he's super fun to talk with. And he's got one of those really great New Zealand accents that just makes him sound smart, you know? So um, let's uh, go straight to the interview. Welcome to the Prolific Author Podcast. Let's face it, readers read fiction to feel emotion and be transported and transformed. In this ongoing digital revolution, where online marketing is always in flux, the only way to create a sustainable author business and live off your royalties is to write transformational stories, market at every stage of the author journey, and cultivate a loyal audience of readers. Fortunately, there's never been more opportunity to make a living as a fiction author. Hi, I'm Lisa Hill. USA Today best-selling author and story clarity coach. When I'm not dictating my own stories about dragons, serial killers, and dystopian worlds, I help other authors write their own transformational fiction, position them as bestsellers, and market them like pros. Join me on the podcast where I give writing tips, marketing how-tos, story advice, and interviews with other authors who are in the trenches just like you and making it work. We are prolific authors.
All right, we are here with Vince Warnock today. How are you doing, Vince? I am fantastic. How are you doing? <laughs> I'm good, yeah. <laughs> well, I'm glad that 2020 is almost over. <laughs> uh, it, I, I was actually, okay, I did think that myself. I've been going through the same process, obviously. You know, this is a difficult year for a lot of people. Although yeah. I'm saying that, I, I feel a little bit guilty because I've actually had a really, really good year. But I've been oh, very close to the pain of other people because I've been helping a lot of companies and entrepreneurs through what they're doing. But I kind of got to the point where I was like, oh, I wish this year was over. And then I realized, no, actually, I've got to change my mentality because that you're not defined by a calendar year, right? Now is the kind of time. I, so I've, I've changed my mind. At least I've said, right, that's <laughs> it. I am going to right now, I'm going to say the rest of that year is finished. It is a whole brand new day today. And every day is a good day. So yeah, anyway, that's yeah, my good epiphany for, you. for the morning. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's a very healthy way to look at it. We should all probably yeah. take that aspect now, a little bit more. Full, full disclosure, I'm saying this at the moment in the middle, I was just telling you off here, but the, um, we're in the middle of a storm at the moment, so it's torrential <laughs> rain and flooding and everything else like that. So, but I'm choosing to ignore all of that and go, you know what, life is wonderful. I don't care that I'm freezing cold. It's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's good. We can all learn a lesson from you. <laughs> <laughs> um, why don't you start by telling everyone who you are and what you do and what you write? Okay. All right. Um, wow. Okay. Uh, <laughs> we can't throw the deep end. Um, we were just saying off here, I don't like to be prepared for any of these kind of uh, interviews or anything like that because I, I just love the natural flow of them. And then every time I get into them, I think, oh man, maybe I should have prepared something. <laughs> now, um, <laughs> so yeah, as, as we heard, I'm Vince Warnock. Uh, I'm based here in Wellington, New Zealand, right in the middle of the storm. Uh, I am a, what am I? I'm a marketing coach, a marketing strategist. I am the uh, author of Chasing the Insights, uh, and I'm also the host of the Chasing the Insights podcast. Uh, but really, up until January this year, uh, January 2020, I was the chief marketing officer at Cigna. Um, so I've got a background in many different things, running my own startups and, and selling them off and working in radio and electronics engineering and computer engineering and, and lots and lots of fun. So I've pivoted so many times in my career, but this year has been the major one for me. So um, as I said, I was the chief marketing officer. Marketing is something that I'm very passionate about, but I have felt a real challenge uh, near the end of last year. And last year was when I published my first book. And that was an incredible process and an amazing feeling, by the way, but also a challenging one for me personally, because imposter syndrome got its greedy little teeth into me and yep. I went through a weird little spiral. So I'm like, okay, right, I need to get through that. But discovered in getting through that and in dealing with that, it really is a lot about talking to other people. It's about talking to my mentors, my coaches around um, how I'm feeling and what I'm going through. But then I discovered the more dialogue that there was around this, the more I talked to other people, the more I realized that other people were going through this as well and were impacted by this. And I had just felt this need to write a book documenting that kind of journey and, and really kind of giving the blueprint that I'm working to uh, which is to kind of rewire my brain, basically to create your brain's own operating system. So I felt this passion to write this book and I'm like, right, that's it. I'm going to do it. The other thing I discovered is being a chief marketing officer, you have no time. I'm sorry. It is more <laughs> than a full-time job. It is just crazy. We were going through so many major projects. We bought another company. We're about the same size as our own. So I had to integrate that within the organization, integrate a lot of the technology, remove the brand from market, plus rebrand ourselves, go through new campaigns. Um, it's a lot of work and, yeah. and a lot of stress and a lot of anxiety and a lot of sleepless nights. So I had no time to write. And I got to the end of last year and there's a couple of kind of pivotal moments. One of them was realizing I had been on the road for a roadshow meeting with all these insurance advisors and had pneumonia for the entire time, uh, oh. thinking I just had the flu. And I'm like, okay, okay. apparently according to my doctor anyway, that's not healthy. That's, that's not a good state to be in. So I was like, okay, I need to look after myself. Uh, but also having this burning desire to get this book out of me and to impact as many people as possible and to help a lot of the people I've been talking with over the past year, a lot of people have been coaching over the last five or six years um, to help them with what I'm learning over the way. And I haven't solved all the problems or anything like that. I'm still going through all this stuff, but I certainly have found some really uh, interesting ways to kind of cope and deal with that. So, so I decided that's it. I need to leave a very well-paying job uh, and go out and just write full time, which uh, earns you nothing. Um, so it was an interesting, easy, and difficult decision all at the same time. I love where I work. I love the work we we're doing, but the reality was 
I needed to follow a calling. And so I made the leap. And from there, from January this year, when I left, or I think I left early Feb, actually, just before COVID hit over here. So that was a mm-hmm. beautiful timing. Like, honestly, the amount of, <laughs> as soon as I heard the chaos that was ensuing and heard everything else, I was just like, <laughs> your problem now, not mine. <laughs> it was inspired. I, oh, I know. I did have one of my old colleagues call me up and go, you jerk. <laughs> I was like, you can leave too. And he goes, no, I can't. <laughs> so... So that was, a, that was an interesting time for me. And also in writing the book, I was obviously talking to, you know, I interviewed as many people as possible. And I was talking to a lot of entrepreneurs and business owners in the US and Australia and here in New Zealand as well. And when COVID hit, um, it hit hard. And for a lot of these people, you know, I, I was very conscious I was in a privileged position. I didn't need to work. Um, I was doing something I'm passionate about. But for a lot of these people that I was talking to, they had all the same overheads, all the same costs, all the same um, you know, requirements on their you know, paying salaries and all these kind of things, but no revenue coming in at all. Mm-hmm. And for a lot of these businesses, that was it. So I felt that pain um, and I've been through that myself many times before and I just couldn't leave it there. I was like, okay, you know, you guys have given up your time freely for me to help me with putting this book together. Is there anything I can help with? And that's when I started to discover um, another side of my calling, which was helping entrepreneurs and small business owners, helping them to reposition themselves, helping them to pivot. Um, in one case, we got uh, a, a knitting cafe in Melbourne. Uh, it was just wonderful to be able to help them. And, and to be clear, they did all the work themselves. I just guided them. But they had no income coming in. So they had a, a shop there, a cafe, where you come in, you buy your cup of coffee and your scone, and you learn to knit and do some knitting, and then you <laughs> buy your supplies from there. And then they supplement it. They had this amazing business model. They supplemented it with doing events, like knitting cruises, which apparently is a thing. You jump on a cruise ship. You, I don't know, guess, I guess you learn a couple <laughs> of stitches, and then you get absolutely drunk and do karaoke and dancing and just have an absolute <laughs> blast. Uh, and they do vineyard tours where you learn to knit and get drunk there's a there's a theme here Um, (laughs) but they had this incredible fan base of followers um, but they no one could come to their store no one could Mm -hmm. go to their events because the events were all cancelled so I said to them look have you thought of putting all your products online and and they had and they've been through this process but they had been duped before they paid ten thousand dollars to get a website built the guy never finished it then they got someone else in who said look I can do it but I'm not familiar with the technology, so it's going to have to be a rebuild, and that'll cost you ten thousand. And by the way, I don't do this aspect and that aspect, and they were just like, "This is this is too much." We honestly, we don't know even enough to ask the right question. So I said, "Okay, hold my beer. I can teach you guys. Let me do this." And they were like, "No, nah, come on." We were technologically challenged. I went, "Well, let's let's give it a shot anyway." So over the period of a weekend. Um, I taught them Shopify, showed them what to do um, wonderfully. And this is one of those perfect moments. Their, their point of sale system they use in, in store is an online based one. So you can literally just go export all of your products, import directly into Shopify. Piece nice. of cake. Uh, yeah. And within a weekend, they were up and running. And since then, they now make more money online than they've ever made in any endeavors. Um, wow. As well as they got a notification from Shopify to say, hey, you are the 15th highest transaction Shopify shop in Australia, which is huge. Um, yeah. And, and there's just these two little old ladies from Melbourne who suddenly realized that <laughs> most of Australia and possibly the world need what they've got. They mm-hmm. need, especially in a time of COVID where people are stressed and people are so helping them to kind of pivot, helping them to do this was immensely satisfying for me, but just seeing them turn up on their Facebook live, um, having a few wines and telling everyone, we did it, we did it, we built this ourselves. Uh, it was amazing. So, so I'm doing a lot of work around that, a lot of work around fi- um, companies and entrepreneurs finding additional revenue streams, but additional ways to both add value and get value back from their customers. Uh, and of course, the main thing is, is helping them to define their brand story define who they are and making that real connection with their customers so honestly this year has been a blast and then of course i launched the podcast hello um (laughs) that's gone gangbusters that was just a that was just a passion project it was like okay i'm doing this selfishly for me i don't care about any of you no i do care about everyone (laughs) uh, i was like right i i miss the days of radio i genuinely do i vividly remember when i was seven i bought built my first crystal radio set so i just got 
parts of old radios together uh, and old other electronics devices and built a crystal radio set. And I used to sit there and listen uh, to these DJs who I was going, these guys have the most perfect job in the world. They literally get to play music, which I love. They get to hang out with people that obviously sound cool and they get to have a whole pile of fun. What a dream job. So at age seven, I decided at one point I was going to be a DJ. And fast forward many, many years from then, uh, I took a job at one of our biggest radio stations here as an on-air announcer and absolutely loved it. It really did live up to what I thought it would except for one aspect, and that was the lack of pay. It was <laughs> radio, radio announcers. Guys, if, if you've got a favorite radio announcer, go and just send them something. Just tip them. Just, I don't know, send them gifts because they get paid nothing, right? It's really? a shockingly bad job, yeah. Wow. So I, I do miss the day. So I had to leave there because I had my own companies I was setting up at the time and um, and went on crazy journeys and things. And I've been missing those days. So a podcast was my secret way to kind of relive those glory days on radio and go hey uh -huh. i get to hang out with people all over the world and and get amazing guests on here like yourself um, and, <laughs> and just talk with cool people and i, I kind of positioned it as being uh, like a, a a coffee or a single malt scotch together over zoom or over whatever to platform right. you're using just sitting there picking their brains on in marketing and sales and entrepreneurship um, but then I discovered, by the way, that most of the people I interview are you know, in the US and Canada, and most of the times I'm recording them around four or five in the morning in our time. <laughs> apparently, it's not socially acceptable to drink a single malt scotch at that hour. So, <laughs> so I kind of pivoted that a little bit, and it's just a fireside chat. But honestly, it's been a blast, and I've just put out the uh, – we're, we're coming very close to 30 episodes, um, and it has far exceeded the reach that I thought it would, and – yeah. The feedback I've been getting from people, it's just, it's become a really worthwhile endeavor and something I'm really enjoying. So yeah, there you go. There's my whirlwind tour. Wow. Okay. <laughs> yeah. uh, no, that's great. I'm glad you've had such a great year and that your business is growing. You know, yeah. everybody is hoping for that right now, but we're definitely seeing a lot of things go online that didn't used to be. And I don't know, do you think it's ever going to go back to what it was? I kind of don't think that it's going to ever be quite what it was before COVID hit. Yeah. I don't think fully. I've been I've been pondering this as you do, um, and one of the things I think that COVID has done it's forced us into a position where everybody's really had to define what's important to them. And for a lot of people, they've discovered that you know getting the freedom to work at home means that they get to spend more time with their loved ones, means they get more flexibility, means they they can get more productive. Um, there's mm -hmm. nothing worse than sitting in an office environment when you're tired. And going, oh, I've got to, got to look like I'm working, and hopefully the boss yeah. doesn't see over my shoulder. And oh no, I need to go for a walk and clear my head. And whereas if you're at home, you can go, you know what? I'm just going to go down for a nap. I'm, I'm just going to go <laughs> refresh myself, and then come back up and do some more work. And people are finding they're way more productive. Right. But the flip side of that, so those people will be looking at going. This is more important to me to be able to have that freedom, to be able to have that time with the family, um, mm -hmm. to have that flexibility. But for others they've kind of looked at it and gone, you know what? I actually really do appreciate the time of being face to face with adults and not just children, um, but also <laughs> having other human beings around me. So I, I think it's, I think it's kind of going to balance itself out, but I think we have turned a corner and I think business wise yeah. companies have realized that you cannot just do the old way of doing things and expect to succeed, especially in these kind of environments. You need to have flexibility for your employees um, you need to have additional revenue streams coming in that can cope with if you can't do anything face to face. Um, one of the one of the clients I was dealing with is a chiropractor, and uh, they would go into businesses and do chair massages and all these kind of things. Obviously, all of that's done. People are working from home. You can't really, and you're not right. allowed to kind of get around people with social distancing. It's kind of hard to massage someone socially distanced. Um, so they've had to rethink how they serve their customers mm -hmm. and how they can go in and go. You know what? I'm just going to teach people how to self-care i'm going to teach them how to actually relax and do breathing exercises and massage themselves or their partners and things like that as well um, and that's going game busters for them but it was just a chance for people to stop reflect work out what's important and go you know what maybe we can do things different so so i expect it's not going to be fully as swung pendulum wise as it is at the moment there is going to be some equilibrium that's going to be found there but it certainly won't rest where it was previously or at least i hope yeah, yeah, I agree. I agree. So you and I met about um, a month ago, and we figured out that we have a lot of similarities. You coach 
mostly nonfiction authors and I coach mostly yeah. fiction authors, but we have very similar, um, you know, systems in place for the way we do our coaching. Um, but I liked what you said a few minutes ago when you were talking about teaching people how to uh, figure out what their brand story is. Can you tell us more about that? I think that's something that would really apply to my audience pretty heavily. Yeah, definitely. I like it. It's okay. I'm going to give you a real life example. I'm going to redact the name okay. so I don't embarrass the person because he's probably going to listen to this. Um, but <laughs> one of my clients, I still remember sitting down with him going, look, uh, we are working out the why part of his business. Like, why are you so passionate about doing this? Why do you love your job? And his answer was, because it pays really good money. Um, <laughs> and I was like, okay, well, this is going to be tougher than I thought. Um, it was like, okay, so why, like, why do you help so many people? Like, why do you get a sense of satisfaction? And he goes, I, I, I really like producing good quality work. And again, I'm going, this is going to be tougher than I thought. So <laughs> what I do is I push the work stuff aside with them. And I said, okay, look, park that over there for the moment. What I want to do is I want to talk to you. And I just interviewed them and said, look, I want to talk to you about your journey. Like what is the earliest you ever remember working in this specific area? And I'm, I'm deliberately being vague here, so I don't accidentally name them. <laughs> but when, you know, when, when I can flip it out if you do. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But what is, you know, what is your earliest memory of working in this kind of field and this kind of thing? And he, he went all the way back to being a child. And he was going, oh man, I remember my dad and my mum and we would come together. And, we, and I said, so you've seen the power of this to bring people together. And he goes, yeah, totally. And then he went on his journey more and he had traveled the world and he had seen all these stories of people out there and seen all these different things and going, man, if only I could help all these people. And I'm like, so there's your passion and there's your why. And then we kind of structured, like I go through this, um, I call it the beats concept. So we work out the story beats, like all the different things that have happened in your life and your personal life and your work life that have contributed to who you are, to why you do what you do, to what you do, to how you do it, um, all those kind of things. Um, so we went through this and by the time he finished, he crafted the story based on these beats. And, and the idea is because of these beats, whenever you're getting interviewed, you can kind of flip from one to the other. It's not, it doesn't have to be linear. And I sat down and I said, okay, I'm going to pretend I'm interviewing you for my podcast and started talking. And it was one of the most inspiring stories I'd ever heard. And I was like, oh my goodness. And I felt this immediate connection to this guy, even though I already knew him, I'm coaching him. And I'd worked with him in the past, by the way. So he was a, a vendor of ours when I was at, um, at Cigna. So I was like, okay. So I understood what he did, but suddenly I had more passion towards this. And I was like, man, this is uh, like, if I'm telling a story or if I'm, um, I'm trying to be vague again, uh, if I'm <laughs> wanting something that he offers, let's just say that, then I would choose him over anybody else because immediately I feel the sense of connection. I feel this, um, if, like, if he was remote, for example, I'd feel a pseudo social relationship where I, I feel like I know him. Uh, I want to use the term intimately, but you know what I mean? I, yeah. I feel like I, I, I've had beers with him sitting down, having a chat with him and, and know him really, really well, um, just from his story. So for me, that's the really important part for nonfiction, for um, any kind of uh, you know, entrepreneur that really, particularly if their brand is centered around themselves, it is how do they weave in the elements of their journey, of their story in a way that makes sense to people, in a way that shows some vulnerability because there's a whole pile of, and I go through the science of how your brain works, um, like immediately when you're telling stories, by the way, so quick, quick sidebar for the moment, immediately when you're telling <laughs> stories, your brain is actually receptive to it because of um, how like evolution and how we've grown up that we used to mm -hmm. share our history through short stories. We used to teach through stories. This is long before we had, you know, printed word or computers or audio right. or video or anything like that. Um, so we used to share stories and that's how we taught. So your brain is receptive to this. But if in that process of telling your story, you show some vulnerability early on, then your reptilian brain, so your crocodile brain, we call it, which is the defense mechanism that your brain has to protect you, immediately sees vulnerability from the storyteller and goes, oh, this must be a safe environment. This must be somewhere I can lower my defenses. I mean, hey, reptilian brain, you're not needed right now. You go down there and have a break. You know, you go have off and uh, go off and have a nana nap. Right now, mm -hmm. I'm going to be open and receptive to what this person is telling me. So if that story then involves how you serve other people and how you work with them, there's immediate affinity towards them. So if 
your, uh, what you're offering then meets the needs of them. You already have built that trust. You already, they feel that they know you and they already like you, so which is the three kind of core components of, of marketing and selling. So, oh man, I, I could rant on for hours about this, but it is just <laughs> so important. Your personal story matters and everything you've gone through in life like even the bad stuff, the good stuff, the bad stuff, the things that you've learned along the way, they actually shape you into who you are and you are something cool. So, um, yeah, this is part of the journey is understanding that it makes you who you are and that is really important. So, yeah, oh, there we go. Oh, I'm, I'm removing my soapbox now. <laughs> I can come back down to earth. <laughs> yeah. No, no, I really like that. And, I mean, in terms of fiction authors, so you would probably recommend that, I mean, of course they have the beats of their fiction story, which is what they yeah. write, but – that they would they uh, like do you use like joseph campbell's beats or do you have like your own proprietary beats that you use to tell the story i i don't deliberately use uh, joseph campbell's beats but because what i do is i kind of structure it around the core components so the who the what the where the why the how and the when okay. um so there's different aspects of that and the beats kind of get categorized into all of these but narrative wise when you're going through this journey it always ends up being joseph campbell's it, it's always the monument yeah. because i mean it, Look, I know there's different storytelling mechanisms. I know that there's different, you know, uh, ways to tell a story. But the reality is, if I look at what I like, um, you know, Star Wars, comic book movies, all of these, all of them, all of them are the monolith. That, let's just face right. it. Right? That is the best way to tell a story. But the other, the other key element there is this, this storytelling mechanism also translates into things like sales copy or web copy and all these kind of things. And one of the things I teach them is, you know, this whole concept similar to Joseph Campbell, you are the Yoda in that story. You know, you, you are the, the Mr. Miyagi. You are the one that's going to guide the hero, which is your customer, your potential client. You are going to guide them to the, the ultimate conclusion where their needs are met and that they become a better person from it. So, so your story has to have that affinity because they have to have that connection like Daniel San does to Mr. Miyagi or like, you know, Luke has to Yoda, those kind of things. So, yeah, yeah. So, that, I mean, you would um, recommend then that, that when they're marketing to their readers, that they come up with their own story to yep. draw in the reader and guide them into, you know, their fiction funnel yeah, or whatever. Yeah, true. It yeah, it's, it's interesting. I mean, I, full disclosure, I haven't written fiction before, so, except for a couple of kids' books, which haven't published yet. Um, but oh, one day I plan to, but I envy <laughs> fiction writers. Like, honestly, the creativity you have is just amazing. Uh, I, I think... And some people will disagree with me, but I think nonfiction is a lot easier to write because it is your own personal journey. It's your own personal findings and things along the way. Um, so, but for a fiction writer, if I look at the writers that I really like, the irony is I do know about them. I, I don't just pick up a book from a faceless author. I pick up a book from somebody who uh, I've connected with in some way, uh, or I have seen talking somewhere, or I've heard something different about, like Kevin J. Anderson, right. for example. Um, I'm a giant Star Wars nerd, so I really loved his books in the Expanded Universe, now the Legacy yeah. Universe. Um, but the thing I loved about Kevin J. Anderson was finding out all his little quirks, like the fact that he does all of his writing verbally, like he just mm -hmm. translates all of his writing and things. I'm like, oh my goodness, that's so different. I really like that. And it's just the quirkiness of the difference of that. I'm going, okay, I now feel a connection towards this person. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I like that. Very, very true. <laughs> So you are, you know, what is your book? Is, is your book um, Chasing the Insights, is it about how people can do this, you know, for your clients? Or how does your book fit into all of it? Uh, ironically, it doesn't. No, it does. <laughs> <laughs> so my first book, um, I'll give you a little bit of background on it because you'll, you'll understand the concept of it a little bit more. But um, firstly, my motivation for writing a book. Um, I have multiple motivations. The first one was someone once told me, you'll never make an author knowing <laughs> challenge accepted <laughs> right? <laughs> because they were just, Oh, they were just such an angry little person. And <laughs> they, just, they got really annoyed that I kept getting, uh, there was a lot of demand for me to publicly speak and to present at different conferences uh, mm -hmm. in my area of expertise, which was in marketing and digital marketing. Um, and they were just so fed up with it. And they go, I've written two books, you know, he wouldn't make an author's a-hole. And I'm like, okay, <laughs> right. So, um, so I wrote my book and then, <laughs> Sent, sent a copy from the author's a-hole. Um, <laughs> anyway, so that was, that was a motivation. There was, and, but one of the other motivations there was um, I had, over my career, uh, I was known for certain things. And there was just things that I had had to, through necessity, create uh, in the marketing world. So we had to have ways to validate our concepts and ways to kind of test our thinking. So I had to create a way to do that and then discovered that 
that way I created called Coffee Line Test was actually something really important and other people could get value from this. And the more people I told about this, uh, the more people would adopt it. In fact, I remember um, going to, going to a, a um, advertising agency um, in Auckland, so which is, if you know New Zealand, is basically the other side of New Zealand. Um, so I was up there and I was with this agency. I'd never met them before. And they were talking through their methodologies and they said, oh, at this point, we like to get customer feedback. And we used a system called Coffee Line Test. And I went, Coffee Line Test? And I must have looked blank on my face. I'm like, what? Like my brain's trying to process, hang on, I don't know these people. And they went, oh yeah, yeah, let me explain. And she started trying to tell me about coffee line tests. And I kind of looked past her, realized my book is sitting on her shelf. And then she goes, wait a minute, you're Vince Warnock. Oh, this is so embarrassing. And I'm like, no, 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 do not be embarrassed. I am over the moon right now. Right? This feeling. But it was, so I realized that these kind of things do help a lot of people. And then uh, I think it was when I joined Cigna, I'd always wanted to write a book. And then when I joined Cigna, um, one of the things I discovered was I had come in as, as the specialist, the digital marketing specialist and something that they really, really needed at the time. And I had transformed the way that digital was done in there. So we just mm -hmm. revolutionized. We took it from, I think, uh, two to 4% of their overall sales were from online. By the time I had finished it, it was, it was in the 40%. Wow. Um, and we got so many gains and gains and gains and gains. And it was all through a methodology that I had, which is, and it all comes from imposter syndrome where I'm going, okay, I always feel like the dumbest guy in the room. So I'm just going to try all of these different things and try experimenting, experimenting, experimenting. Um, mm -hmm. And through that, I'd learned a lot of things. I'd learned that you can't just run an experiment. You have to have the right mindset going in there. And you have right. to realize that, you know, like there's this fear of failure that we all seem to have. But the reality is an experiment isn't about win or fail or, you know, succeed or fail. It's about proving or disproving a hypothesis. So right. I thought, right, okay, if I can change the narrative around this for my team, for all the people I'm getting involved in this, it was like, guys, we don't chase the wins, we chase the insights. So mm -hmm. it's not about win, fail, it's about win, learn. And, and it kind of, it just created this environment where people were quite free to try new things and see what the, what would happen from that and see how we can move the needle. And it was just, it was awesome. And, and more and more of um, companies and more and more of Cigna even around the world, all the different markets were all going, Hey, we need this. We need your time. And a lot mm. of people were going, Hey, can we schedule an hour a week with you? And I'm going, okay, there's so many different markets and so many different companies an hour a week. This is actually more than a full-time job. Maybe I'll just write a book on it. And that way I can give it to everyone or sell it to everyone, make some money, right. <laughs> sell it to them all, and they can adopt the methodology. So, so that was the premise behind it. So it really is about experimentation, um, mm -hmm. but it's this culture of experimentation. So it's the books in three parts. The first part is the framework I created, which is the chaser method. Um, and that is really about setting yourself up for success with it experimentation and marketing and digital marketing but it also can be translated to sales to entrepreneurship itself there's so many different facets but right. the second half of the book or second half second third of the book um, was around the mindset required and how to cultivate the right mindset to be able to execute experimentation but also to keep positive and keep these incremental gains happening um, so mm -hmm. i talk about cultivating curiosity removing cognitive bias um, creating fortitude and resilience in yourself all these kind of things um, so I took them through all this. And then the last part of the book was practical experiments because I'm a very practical person. So I want to, I want them to be able to go, right, I've learned the framework. I have now, I'm working on my mindset stuff because it's a constant battle. Um, mm -hmm. But then I have experiments that I can literally pick up and run with right now. So there's experiments from myself uh, and I've got three other um, digital marketing leads from around the world. Uh, one from the UK, one from the US and one from New Zealand who have contributed their own uh, experiments and things that people can do as well. So mm -hmm. So it's not really related to the coaching work I'm doing in its truest form, but a lot of the mindset stuff in there and a lot of the, the things I learned through this and a lot of things I've learned just being a published author are what right. I'm helping people with now. So, and that's where I did think of when I was setting up the podcast, I was like, okay, that's it. I need to create a brand for myself and I need to, so I was working on creating a secondary brand or just, just call it Vince Warnock. And I was trying to work out all this and uh, I was coaching someone in the U S and they bumped into someone and said, Oh, I'm working with this guy from New Zealand. They went, Oh, who's that? And they went, well, you won't know him, but it's Vince Warnock. And they went, wait, this is the chasing the insights guy. And I was like, oh, damn it. I already have a brand. I just didn't click. <laughs> so, <laughs> so now everything's under the Chasing the Insights uh, umbrella, which 
does fit because it is about understanding things. It's about getting ultra curious and and most of the uh, most of the principles I teach in marketing is based and founded in that curiosity and and just constantly looking for those insights. So yeah. So would you? So then it sounds like real true marketing then is just about having to test until you find what works for you. Is that? Would you agree with that? Yeah, it is. It is. Yeah, essentially. I mean, that's the way to boil it down. But it, it's, I mean, the tests themselves, it's not even just looking for what works, but it's, it is looking for the insights. And, and I mean, okay. that's in the truest sense, because when you're uh, looking at your customers and you're looking at how to convert them, or you're looking at how to attract them, or you're looking at all the different aspects there, it's not just about what works and what doesn't work. It's trying to deeply understand your customers. Mm-hmm. And this is the thing I try and teach. And this is the challenge that I had um, as a chief marketing officer as well is because you're quite removed from the clients in a sense is actually trying to teach people that these are the most valuable people to you, right? These are people you don't, you're not just, sell, you're not selling a product. You are helping somebody, right? You're not right. just selling a service. You are producing an outcome for someone. So actually deeply understanding what the outcome they need is deeply understanding you know, how your product can fit that need that is where the success is. It's not about to this campaign work to that campaign work. It's about truly understanding their behaviors, how they think, what their fears are, their objections, what keeps them up at night, all of these different aspects. So, yeah. Yeah. That's really interesting. I like that. So are you planning to write any more books in the future or what are your plans for oh, yeah. moving forward? I, yeah. I, I have a Trello board of ideas and uh, <laughs> it's depressing to look at it because I realize I don't have as much time as I really want in life. But, um, I am working on two books at the moment. I'm writing two books at the same time. Um, so nice. one of those is, uh, it's called Anti-Perfect. And it really is that the one I was talking about around imposter syndrome and self doubt, mm. And it's really helping people to understand that often we, that our version of success or how we measure ourselves is based on where we're not. So it's looking at other people and saying, I want what they've got, but I don't have what they've got yet. So I need to, you know, like basically they look at that gap and go, that's failure, or I need to work harder. I need to work smarter. But in reality, what I'm trying to teach people is don't measure yourself on anybody else or on any kind of version of perfection that you've created in your mind, because it's faulty. And I go through the whole premise of why it's faulty. And, and the fact that most of the people you project is perfect um, they're not perfect and they wouldn't even presume to call themselves perfect. They're usually as much of a hot mess as you are. So instead right. of measuring yourself based on where you're not, measure yourself on based on where you've come from and look at the incremental gains that have got you to where you are and keep those gains moving and just be a better you and a better you. Um, it's so much more fulfilling and it's so much more uh, like uh, it'll give you a sense of accomplishment. So it's dealing with that and rewiring your brain, creating your brain's own operating system. Um, the other book is uh, literally, it, it's, it's one of those things where you don't want to give people credit sometimes and you'll understand why to <laughs> see, but uh, when lockdown had happened, we used to go for daily walks, myself and my wife, we, to be fair, we go for daily walks most of the time anyway, but we were going for a walk and I said to her, you know, what's really frustrating to me. I'm known for so many different things in marketing. Like I've contributed a lot to the industry, but a lot of the things I'm known for are small. They're things that you mm. really couldn't write a whole book on. You know, because it'll, you know, you could basically explain the principle of it in five minutes and then you can create some validation around that and some research to back it up. But the reality is it'll be a very short book. And she goes, yeah, right. it's almost like, and she was being sarcastic, which makes this even worse. She just leaned, turned around and said, yeah, it's almost like you need, a, I don't know, a book of 13 underground secrets from marketers. <laughs> I went, oh. And I laughed with her and thought, ha, oh, that's so lame. And then I thought, damn, that's actually really, really good. So... <laughs> So I've totally stolen the idea and, and had to admit to her that it's her idea. So um, so nice. working on that at the moment, which is really kind of the 13 hacks that I have done in life to help you with your marketing and with your, your entrepreneurship and your sales and things like that as well. Uh, but I have, honestly, I've got about 30 other books, um, nonfiction yeah. books that I want to write. Um, I also, I've written two children's books um, and yeah. I've got a couple more in me as well, which I do want to get out. The only problem with that is, Children's books require art and I'm really, really bad at art. So, <laughs> so I'm looking at collaborating at the moment. With the yeah, I was going to say, you've got to connect with some illustrators then, yeah. Yeah, yeah, totally. <laughs> um, but then I have a desire at one point, and, and don't laugh, uh, I really want to write a science fiction novella. And a novella because I, I don't have the time with everything else I'm doing to write a full novel. But I have this desire. There's a number of different stories, but there's one in particular that I really want to craft into a novella. And I want to put it out there just to say I've written a science fiction book. 
Um, yeah, for but sure. I'm very, very conscious when I look at the quality of the books I read, um, like, wow, this is going to be really hard to match. So <laughs> um, it could be very amateur, but you know what? I don't care. I'm going to do it anyway. So yeah. Yeah. Hey, you got to start somewhere. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, hopefully, 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 start somewhere and and accomplish something from it, and not just get embarrassed. Yeah, but, you know, yeah. <laughs> yeah for my, sure. My, my son issued me a challenge and said, "Oh, you know what? You should you should write the novella and then try and win some like book awards and everything." I'm like, "Dude, I'll be just so happy if I finish the damn thing." <laughs> <laughs> well, hey, you never know. You might write it, and and then you'll be up for the Hugo Award or something like yeah. that. <laughs> He did. He told me the Hugo and then he, he that's what he wanted me to win. So I was like, okay, yeah. all right. That's a, that's a challenge. It's a big challenge. <laughs> yeah. Hey, why not yeah. aim for it? You might as well. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Great. Awesome. So um, tell us a little bit more about your podcast. What kind of, for anyone who maybe hasn't heard of you before, what kinds of people do you interview and, and what's your podcast like? Oh, wow. Okay. So I interview such a broad range of people. The, <laughs> the idea originally was it was just going to be people in the top of the industry in marketing. Um, but then I very quickly discovered that it's, it's designed for entrepreneurs and designed for right. small business owners. And the goal I want is so many people out there are trying to do it themselves. Trying, so many people out there are worried or, or um, you know, risk averse because they're like, I don't want to put myself out there on video because what if that fails? Or I don't want to do it. What if I do it on Facebook and everyone laughs at me? Or what if I, I don't know enough about this? So I thought, right, I'm going to get people in. I'm going to sit down and chat with them. And we're going to talk about um, different aspects of marketing. And that way you can learn from the experts and you can mm -hmm. glean from their ideas. And the idea is we don't just talk about the successes. We talk about failures as well. So that was the, the original premise behind it, but it's, it's evolved even more from then and, and to realizing how many people need help with so many different aspects, how many like entrepreneurs right. need a vast array of help. So we go into mindset stuff. We talk about sales. We talk about all sorts of different things. We talk about book writing, anything that would add value to an entrepreneur uh, I get people on the show to talk about. In fact, one of the episodes that has just gone out last night, um, depending on when this episode goes out. Um, so <clears throat> insert date here. Um, so one of, the, <laughs> one of the recent episodes um, is with a relationship expert. She calls herself a sexpert. Um, so it's helping entrepreneurs to, um, we don't like the word balance, but helping them to juggle their business and their marriage and their family and all these type of things and actually have success in all areas rather than sacrificing from one to succeed in the other. So, right. so we talk about that aspect. I've had a pro wrestler on the show um, talking wow. about personal branding and, and his life philosophies and things. And he's completely mental. So it was awesome. Um, <laughs> so, uh, we had uh, one of my favorite episodes ever um, and apologies to any of the other guests that have been on my show, but you'll know why is uh, my accountability coach. So I have a, I personally hire a coach, a business coach who helps me identify my blind spots and helps me to keep me on track and, and pick me up when I fall apart. Um, but I also <laughs> have an accountability coach and not in the traditional sense, like a lot of people think an accountability coach, you know, checks in to make sure you're doing the work. I have the opposite uh, effect. I, I'm a workaholic if I'm not careful. Um, mm -hmm. So her role she's discovered is to make sure that I'm, I'm looking after myself. So uh, one of those, one of the things she's discovered is I, my happy place is writing. So the most of the check-ins I have with her are, so how much have you written this week, Vince? And I'm like, because uh, <laughs> that's the first thing to go when I'm stressed or anxious or, or under, under the pump. Um, and she will call my wife and go, I think we need to have a chat to him. And they'll go, yep, they'll conspire <laughs> against me. But it's good. It comes from a loving position. But I, I got her on the show to talk about accountability. And um, I, I've got to know her so much, you know, working with her as, her as my accountability coach. So it came across in the episode and we just had an absolute blast. We were cracking up laughing the whole time. And the response to that episode was phenomenal. I, we went oh, to a dinner party. I went to a dinner party with some friends and somebody turned around there and they, they made a quote from that episode. They said, Oh, you don't want to do that. That's in T-Rex brain. You want to be in dolphin brain. And I went, wait, what? And go, <laughs> My brain couldn't press. It. I'm like, how does he know about this? Like, has he, does he know her? Does he, you know, this is one of her things. And he goes, right. Oh, I should tell you, I've been listening to your podcast. Um, I listened to that episode three times because it helped me so much. Wow. And I was like, Oh my goodness. So I fed that back to um, Cindy, who's my cannabis coach. I fed back, that back to her right when she was having a rough day as well. And I was like, I just want you to know this feedback. And she was like, oh my goodness. And she just about cried. It was like, yep. Knowing that you're helping someone through just having right. a conversation on a podcast is so powerful. Um, but the other, the other aspect I do is, is I, I make sure that 
I don't just talk about their area of expertise. So I don't just get a guest on and say, okay, right, tell me about how do we craft the per perfect sales message or how do we go about doing Facebook ads or anything like that. What we do is we break it down in two parts. We talk first about their story and how they got to where they are, why they're so passionate about helping people, why they're so passionate about their area of expertise. And the reason for that is I've found that that in itself is as valuable as what they're teaching, but also it adds context to it. Like if someone gets up and tries to teach me something, I look at them, I'm immediately going, yeah, but who are you? Like, should I value what this person's saying? Because it's untested, a lot of the stuff. So what's the credibility? Right. You're trying to assess them essentially and go, yeah, who is this person that's trying to teach me something? But if you've heard their journey and how they got to where they are, you've immediately got that connection. You've heard their story. Yeah, so mm -hmm. you immediately got that connection with them. So therefore it adds context to what they're teaching. So I really, I really wanted that aspect. And I wanted it to seem like, um, and, and this, this came from somebody I used to work with where they had the opportunity to sit. Uh, they came and met with myself and one of my peers in the industry. And the two of us were just sitting there um, talking about, uh, we were talking about programmatic, something very uninteresting, but we got so passionate about this and, and how we're going to change the industry and how we're going to challenge this and challenge that. And they just sat there with their beer listening in and they said it was one of the most fascinating conversations. And I realized that people like, I love listening to other people talk. Right. I love listening to them bounce off each other and get the creative juices flowing and talk about these different elements and dig into the questions and things. I love hearing this. So other people must love that as well. At least that was my theory. So that's why I put the podcast together in this format. It is really a, just a conversation and drilling into mm -hmm. these areas. And I, I had the best feedback ever. Um, and it was combined feedback around the podcast and the virtual summit I did, which was very much tied to the podcast. Um, and it was a woman who had um, listened to one of the episodes with uh, one of my guests who had talked about her journey and how she was fired multiple times from her job, how she was, um, her husband had walked out on her. But basically all this stuff happened and she got to the point where she felt like an absolute failure and felt mm. like a fraud and felt like a loser. And she was like, that's it. I can't keep doing this, you know. Uh, what, this is ridiculous. And she said she's not into woo-woo or any of that kind of weird stuff, but she heard this voice in her head go, okay, are you ready to be yourself now? Yeah. And so she talked through that journey and it was fascinating. And she's just a wonderful woman. It was one of my favorite guests on the show as well. It was awesome. She's become a very good friend as well. But this woman reached out to me and said, I listened to that episode and it wasn't even the piece of the expertise that she talked about, but her journey made me realize that I'm not alone. And this woman had gone through, she was a high performing um, person, a high performing employee. And then December last year in uh, 2019, a new manager came on board and just did not like her, did not gel with her, so fired her. And she felt like an absolute loser. It felt like she would never work in corporate life again because who would want her? Um, you know, no one would employ her because they know that she was fired so unceremoniously. And she was like, oh man, I just, I can't believe this. I'm doubting myself all the time. So she set up her own company. And she was doing okay in the company, but hearing that interview and hearing that story connected with her so deeply that she realized I'm not alone. Other people have gone through this and it does not define me. It does not make me this loser that I feel. It does not make me a failure. So she wrote this huge post that she put out there on social and through her website and that around her journey and what she had gone through. And two things happen. Number one, the healing begins. Like she's broken through this barrier. Right. She's still got a lot of work to go. She's very aware. You know, she keeps in touch with me regularly now. Um, so a lot of work to go, but the healing has begun, which is really important. But the other thing is it's unlocked so much stuff in her business because she's not carrying that baggage anymore. So that one story alone, and there's many stories that have come through from the podcast, but that one story alone uh, made everything worthwhile. I'm going, you know what? I would, I would double down on the podcast and do it twice as much just to get that kind of result from somebody. I think that that is so powerful. So yeah, so that's, that's the podcast chasing the insights. And uh, honestly, it is just a selfish way for me to connect with so many <laughs> people around the world and, um, and just have an awesome conversation. So yeah. Yeah. Well, and I think you must, you must be right about, about other people, you know, wanting that kind of connection too, because the podcast world is just exploding right now. You know, everybody oh, yeah. is listening to podcasts and that's exactly why, because we get other stories and we get inspired and yeah, yeah. I, I absolutely agree. Great. Well, oh, um, yeah. it's, it's one ahead. of the embarrassing things. I, I'm, 
Oh, no, I was just going to say, as a digital marketer, I project out where everything, I, you know, and I'm relatively good at what I do. So I'm like, okay, I know exactly where this podcast is heading. Three months in, we just crossed the three month anniversary. I'm like, three months in, I expect it to be at this level. That's ambitious, but you know what? I think I can do this. I'll push the marketing out there. I'll be fine. Um, three months in, I am 15 times where I thought I would be. Wow. Like the average downloads on every episode has gone through the roof. And I'm like, okay, this is awesome, but it's also a little bit embarrassing. It means that I'm not that good at forecasting. <laughs> I thought I was. <laughs> but it just goes to show you how much people want connection at the moment. And, and you know, right. it's a perf perfect storm that we're in in 2020. <laughs> yeah, definitely, definitely. And it's always good to come out above where you forecasted rather than far below, right? <laughs> oh, yes, absolutely. Yeah, I'd be questioning myself a lot more if I was below it. <laughs> Yeah. That's awesome. So um, as we kind of wrap up, can you, do you have any advice to give to writers in general who are maybe struggling with their journey a little bit? Yeah. Um, the, the biggest advice I've got is probably when you've published or, or as you're about to go to publish. Um, uh -huh. And this for me was probably the biggest part of putting my first book out there. It was the the fear that starts to kick in and it's not fear of failure or even fear of success. It's fear of being seen and this fear of, nice. Oh my goodness. Once I put this book out there, people will read it and people will judge me. I mean, I vividly remember my uh, book launch. Uh, we did a book launch because someone said, Oh, don't do book launches anymore. No one goes to those. And I'm like, <laughs> amateur, I'm a marketer. <laughs> this is what we do. So we organized this event. We had a hundred or so people there face to face. It was just, it was an amazing atmosphere. Honestly, it was, everything I hoped it would be, but I had to rationalize in my brain and go, okay, I know that people are going to want a signed copy of the book, right? Even though I'm not a celebrity, they'll want my mm -hmm. autograph. I'm a barely average karaoke singer. I have to be okay with this. So, but I realized and I rationalized that if I go to a book launch, that's exactly what I want. So I had to come to terms with that. But then I had to come to terms with the fact when I was there that everybody said, Oh, I can't wait to read this book. And I knotted up on the inside and I had every internal voice screaming at me going, who do you think you are to put a book out there? Like, who do you think you are to call yourself an author? Like what makes you think you're something special that you can write a book uh, or mm -hmm. they're going to read it and go, what an amateur, but you know what? They may, they may not. It's, it doesn't matter. What matters is you are putting yourself out there and you have the opportunity to impact somebody. And right. this is what I've kind of realized. I mean, I know I'm in the nonfiction space. It's probably a little more difficult than fiction, but your books speak to people. Your yeah. stories speak to people. I know the impact that, and I know it's a movie and not a book, but I know the impact <laughs> that Star Wars had on my life. I know the impact that comic books or science fiction when I was growing up had on my life. In a lot right. of cases, the journey that people went on there showed me that things aren't absolute because I grew up in a, a not very nice environment. I grew up in a horrible environment. And seeing stories where there was redemption, seeing stories where the mm -hmm. father figures could redeem themselves to their children and things like that. I was like, you know what? There is hope. So you people are relying on your stories, whether you know it or not, whether you accept that or not, they are relying on you putting yourself out there. So don't hold back because somebody might think that it's amateur or somebody might judge you on it, or you may judge yourself on it. It's not about you. It's about that one person that you're going to impact that one person who needs your story, the one person who needs your nonfiction book or your fiction book. So, so try and make it about them and push through anyway. That would be my best advice because that's the advice I give to myself because that's <laughs> what I need when I'm putting books out there. Yeah. 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 I love that. Thank you for saying that because I think a lot of authors tend to be introverted um, in their personalities. And I think fear of being seen is just like so prevalent in the author space it's all over. Really? So I really, I really appreciate that advice. Well, well if, if, it, if it's, uh, if you think I'm a high extrovert and it's prevalent in me, so I can't even <laughs> imagine what it's like for an introvert go, Oh my goodness, yeah. I'm going to be seen. Ah. Yeah. Right. Right. <laughs> Great. Well, thank you so much for talking to us today. Tell us um, where everybody can find you. Of course there's your podcasts that we've talked a lot yeah. about, but where else? <laughs> Look, the easiest way is uh, go to chasingtheinsights.com. Um, okay. So that's, that's the website for the podcast. It's also the website for the book. But there's a link on there to my Facebook group. And honestly, that is, that's where I hang out all the time. Um, we've got an amazing bunch of entrepreneurs in there who are very supportive. And, uh, and we get to turn up and do Facebook Lives and masterclasses and all sorts of cool stuff in there. But there's also uh, social media is probably the easiest way. Reach out to me if anyone does need help. If anyone needs 
coaching if anyone needs to push through some barriers that they got or really wants to turn their company around or their, their entrepreneurial endeavors, then, hey, at least let's jump on a call um, and I'll see if, it, if it's a good fit. And if it is, we can work out how to do it. Simple as that. Great, great. I will make sure and link to all of those in the show notes. And cool. thank you again for talking to us today. It was really oh, fun. It is my absolute pleasure. This has been so much fun. So <laughs> thank, you for, thank you for having me on this freezing cold day. I'm going to go and put some slippers <laughs> on now. <laughs> oh, good. Okay. Me again. Before you go, if you found value in this episode, I would love it if you could leave me a review. Reviews are the best way to show your appreciation and help others find this podcast. Be sure to screenshot it, share it on your favorite social media network, and tag me at LK Hill Books. Remember, the world needs your stories. Only you can change someone's heart with your fire-breathing dragons, your mind-blowing mysteries, your epic romances, and your intense thrillers. So join the revolution and be a prolific author.